Well, welcome to today's talk, Friday the 25th of November. Now, for the first time in the United States, we've got data that says there's been more COVID deaths in people that are vaccinated versus people that are unvaccinated. And we want to look at that in a little bit of detail in a minute and put some context in that. And also we want to look at the bivalent uh, vaccine boosters that are being given in the States. And we're going to be looking at information from vSafe, which shows that 54.8% of vaccine recipients of the bivalent uh, boosters had uh, systemic side effects, most of which weren't serious in the time frame they were looking at. Now, that's about the only way I can summarise this. It is a bit complicated. And of course, YouTube rules and, and my own personal standards insist that we will be looking at uh, data from official sources and other reputable sources of data. So we're not going against any, uh, any guidelines from the United States government. Now, um, here we have this. This, this, was, this was a report. It was commissioned by the Washington Post. Uh, Kaiser Family Foundation Vice President Cynthia Cox, who does a lot of this kind of work. Now, um, this is quite interesting. 58% of coronavirus deaths in August were people who were vaccinated or boosted. And that is people who'd had a primary uh, course of vaccines, at least a primary course of vaccines. So what it looks like is happening here is we're getting waning of the protective effects of the vaccines. It's now waning. And of course, this combined with the um, systemic side effects that we're going to look at from the booster doses needs to be taken into account as we consider the, 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 consider the risk of benefit analysis. Because we started these vaccination programs a while ago and the risk benefit analysis has changed. Um, we're not saying the vaccines aren't effective. We're not saying that the, 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 anything about the vaccines. We're just saying the risk benefit analysis has changed. Let's go on. Um, so therefore, 42% of deaths in August were in people who were unvaccinated. So the majority, for the first time, there were more deaths, COVID deaths in the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated population in the United States. Now, it's fair to contextualize this, because if we look at CDC data, we do find that 80.06% of the United States population is vaccinated. So there's more people in the vaccinated group than in the unvaccinated group, but it's also true, as we saw, that there were more COVID deaths in the vaccinated group for the first time. Now, historically, this is quite interesting. September 2021, uh, vaccinated people, 23% of uh, coronavirus fatalities in people that were vaccinated. January and February 2022 had gone up to 42%. And uh, as we saw now, it's now gone up to... 58%. So we see that the risk of benefit analysis is changing. The data is there before our eyes. So a direct quote from the Kaiser Foundation in the Washington Post, we can no longer say this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. So uh, Mr. Biden's, um, not saying Mr. Biden was wrong at the time, but um, times have changed. Uh, we know protective effects wane and this needs to be taken into account when we look at risk benefit analysis in my view. So this was a, the, the Kaiser Foundation who conducted the analysis. Now, a Centre for Disease Control and Prevention, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. And this is this paper here from, from the CDC. So we're banging, banging in the middle of official US government data. Safety monitoring of bivalent COVID-19 vaccines. Now, um, August the 31st, 2022, um, the FDA authorised the bivalent booster for Pfizer and Moderna. Um, MRA encoding the spike protein from the original SARS coronavirus 2 and from Omicron BA4 and BA5. So it was this bivalent combination vaccine. Advisory Committee on Immunisation uh, practice recommended all persons over 12 receive an age appropriate uh, dose of the one of these vaccines. That was their 
recommendation at the time and indeed still is. Now, vSafe is a voluntary smartphone-based US safety surveillance system established by the CDC to monitor adverse events after COVID vaccination. And here we have it, so it's a vSafe here. Now, um, I don't actually know too much about that. So if it, people that are using it in the States, if they can give me some feedback on that, that would actually be really, uh, really quite useful to get some information on that. As of the 3rd of October, I believe there were 10 million users uh, of that period of time. So it looks like it's being fairly well used. Are we getting better data now from the States? It certainly is starting to look that way. We're getting better quality data. Now, um, Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System is the other way, of course, and um, information is also taken from that. Total data from the 31st of August to the 23rd of October, 14 odd million uh, had received a Pfizer, BioNTech, 8.2 million. Uh, the Moderna's just over, uh, I think the Moderna's just over 18s. So pretty large numbers that we're getting here. Now, vSafe is a bit more confusing. Uh, it looks like in this period of time, there was 211,959 registrants age, over the age of 12. Slightly complicated as well because um, people under the age of 16 have to have um, supervision to use this program. So quite uh, how that's working out, um, I don't really know in the States. Um, but registrants, now it looks like these are people that had just started using the app in that period of time. But as is often the case with CDC, it's not that clear really. The way they write is, um, is not, that, not that transparent very often. August 31st to 23rd of October is the period of time. So um, just that finite window of time, 2022. Reports in the week after vaccination. So this is just a one week period. Now, clearly, you don't have to be a, that clever to realise that this isn't going to pick up any potential long term side effects. We're not saying there are long term side effects, but any potential long-term side effects would, by definition, not be picked up in the first week. So it is limited. But anyway, injection site reaction 60.8%. That's not too surprising and it's not really concerning. You get a sore arm, of course. Um, systemic reactions, though, this is more concerning to me, 54.8%. Uh, fewer than 1%, and I think we'll see later it's about 0.8%, uh, received medical care. So vSafe is reporting that some people did need uh, medical opinions and medical care after the vaccination. I don't think that's controversial. It's a simple statement of fact. Uh, vaccine adverse events reported system. So uh, 5,542 reported adverse events of bivalent uh, vaccine. Pretty small number, really, actually. Um, are all the cases being reported to VARAS? Of course not, of course not. Uh, but 4.5% of those were serious. Now remember, this is of cases actually reported, uh, but still a reasonable proportion of the cases actually reported were classified as being serious uh, adverse events. Now, this is straight from the CDC. Healthcare providers and patients can be reassured that adverse events reported after bivalent boosters are consistent with those reported after monovalent vaccines. Do you see what they've done here? They're comparing the bivalent boosters with the monovalent. They're comparing two groups. This is a relative risk, not an absolute risk. Not saying the CDC are being disingenuous. Not at all but we, they are reporting a relative risk, not an absolute risk. The absolute risk, um, they, they didn't put that in, not given. So it's a relative risk. The absolute risk is going to be smaller than the relative risk. How much smaller? Don't know, they didn't say. Information not given, disappointing uh, from the CDC that they're just talking about relative risk. Uh, health impacts after COVID vaccines, uh, vaccination are less frequent and less severe than those associated with COVID illness. Again, they're comparing people that have had illness with people that are vaccinated, a relative risk, not an absolute risk for the whole population. I'm not saying the CDC are being deliberately disingenuous here, but it would have been better to have information on absolute risk as well as relative risk. 
unfortunately, the, the absolute risk is not given, but we know it will be smaller than the relative risk. Now, the reference they use for this is interesting because they're making this broad statement here, health, health impacts, which, so health impacts is a broad statement. It applies to everything. But the reference they give, reference to there, is quite specific. Uh, that's the reference there. And uh, it just refers to myocarditis, pericarditis, and combinations of those, or multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. Within seven days or 21 day risk window after the index date. So again, this is only a 14 day window that they're taking this information from. And even then they're giving it as a relative risk. I mean, we're not saying the CDC are trying to give the wrong impression here, but it just doesn't seem very well written to me. Um, I, I, I know many relatively junior academics who could write it much more clearly than this, I, I think. But we're not arguing with the numbers that the CDC are giving. We're more uh, commenting on their, on their presentation. OK, comparison between and after uh, uh, vaccines after infection. Again, they're comparing between the infections and uh, after the vaccines. Two groups, the relative risk between those. Absolute risk not given again. So we see that the CDC are really giving relative risks, comparing one group with another group, not giving the absolute risk for the population as a whole. CDC, please, you need to give both. We need to know what the absolute risk is as well as the relative risk, please. Now, a bit, a bit, a bit more detail here. Um, review of vSafe data from the mobile app. Um, again, during August the 31st to 23rd of October, same time period. Uh, now, this is what they say, 211,000, 212,000 nearly registrants. These are presumably people that registered new, newly in that period of time. Um, they covered a fairly good uh, age group, um, a few to 12 to 17s, as we see there, more in the, uh, more in the older age groups. But a good, a good spread of ages, no complaints there at all. Uh, quite a few of these, 45% uh, were the fourth dose and the fifth dose was 50.2%. But of course, we know that if these risks, if the heart disease complications, especially that, that the CDC does admit can occur after vaccines, they're more likely after the second dose. So again, it's not giving a really good overall picture. It's really quite specific uh, to these um, bivalent uh, boosters that they're talking about. Uh, in the week after re re receiving um, a bivalent booster dose, local injection site reactions. Now, this is interesting. 49.7% uh, amongst the over 65s, higher in the younger age group, and the age group they use for comparison here is the 18 to 49. So younger people, men and women, getting more local uh, reactions. Systemic reactions, it's the same. 18 to 49 getting 67.9% local reactions as opposed to 43.5 in the over 65s. And when they look at the specific problems, they see this same trend that it's younger people that are getting more. So 30% in older people, 53% in younger people. Headache, again, 19.7 in older people, 42.8% in younger people. And again, we see it the same with the muscle pain and the fever. Now, reported inability to complete normal daily activities was 10.6% amongst those over 65 and 19.8% in those aged 18 to 49 after vaccination. So over 19% in that younger age group couldn't carry out their normal activities after the, uh, the booster vaccine. I would have thought these are fairly... Fairly high numbers. Uh, receipt of medical care was reported by 0.8%. Now, 0.8% who took medical advice after vaccination, I would have thought that is rather high. But the CDC just report it. They don't say anything about it. They just say that's what it was. I would have thought it's rather high. 0.8%. You can decide whether you think that's high, low or uh, indifferent. Again, we're talking about risk benefit analysis. So, so th there we go. Um, 
I know that's fairly data intense, um, but it looks like um, the risks after the risk of um, side effects after vaccination are becoming clearer with uh, VSafe. Although uh, I don't yet fully understand how it's working, but it's good that these are being honestly uh, reported. And just combine that with the risk benefit analysis um, that uh, more COVID deaths are now occurring in vaccinated versus unvaccinated, despite the fact uh, we have to be clear about it, only 20% of the, uh, the population are unvaccinated. So the vaccinated is a much larger group. Thankfully, though, uh, COVID cases uh, are getting uh, milder. They still do cause some deaths, as we've seen, seen some hospitalizations, but the trend is that they're getting milder. And I think these things should be taken into account with a risk benefit uh, analysis. So that's about as far as we can go on this talk, I think. Uh, lots of data there. All the references are given. I've been as, honestly, I've been as honest to the data as I can and um, check the links. And uh, I'm pretty sure all, my, all of my numbers are, are accurate. Uh, you'll have to decide uh, how you interpret the information I have given you. Interesting. Don't want to say any more. Well, could say more, but probably best not say more. Thank you for watching.